Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think we'll make a start. So, uh, yeah, well, welcome to everyone here in the, the second student centre here at York University's Keel campus, and also a big welcome to those of you who are joining on uh, us online. Um, uh, tonight is the 2023 Kitty Lundy Memorial Lecture to be given this year by the President and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation and York alumna, uh, Paulette Senior. My name is Ravi DaCosta and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, uh, which hosts the lecture uh, now in its ninth year. Before we begin tonight's event, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we're meeting uh, for this uh, event tonight. For those of you who are watching online, I'd encourage you, uh, and who may be on other territories, I'd encourage you to consider those lands that you are on um, and the nations and communities that have looked after and continue to care for them. At York University, we recognise that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which our campuses are located and that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence uh, on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tukaronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you. The Kitty Lundy Memorial Lecture is one of the annual highlights of our, uh, for our faculty and over the last decade, uh, we've been honoured to host diverse and distinguished lecturers, scholars, artists and community leaders. Uh, who've helped bring our community together to think about questions of equity, education and social justice and from a variety of different perspectives and experiences. Tonight will be no exception and I'm very much looking forward to listening to the experiences and insights of our, uh, for, from this year's speaker. After her lecture uh, this evening, Paulette has, has very kindly offered to take questions from the audience and uh, I believe we may have some from our uh, attendees online as well. Um, and we'll ha we have some microphones set up for anyone who would like to ask a question. I'd encourage you to do so. Finally, a couple of housekeeping items for those of you online. Uh, we have arranged <coughs> excuse me, to have live ASL interpretation and closed captioning for this meeting. So any participants who would benefit from the closed captioning uh, online are encouraged to bring their mouse to the bottom of the screen and select closed caption and then show subtitle. We also encourage you to use the hashtag uh, um, uh, YULundy to share your reactions and comments on social media. Uh, with that, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the Dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, JJ McMurtry, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Ravi, and thank you everybody for being here in person and being here online. On behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, I'm so pleased to welcome everybody here today, virtually and in person, to the annual Kitty Lundy Memorial Lecture. This lecture honors Kitty Lundy, who was committed to equity, inclusion, and diversity. And the Lundy family has been extraordinarily generous in its support of this important lecture. We are pleased that Tony Lundy and Janet Looker from the family are joining us virtually this evening. Hello. And we continue to honor Kitty's wonderful legacy with this lecture. Kitty was a passionate teacher dedicated to social justice in and outside of the classroom. And I'm so thrilled that Paulette Sr. is here today uh, to continue this important work with us all. For the last few years, our faculty has been working on addressing long-standing and structural inequalities inside the university and outside. In 2020, the faculty began work on anti-black racism strategy with the guidance of Professor Andrea Davis, who's here in the crowd, and currently with Paul Lowry, who's working with us on these important missions. As part of this strategy, we made an important commitment to prioritize equity, diversity, and inclusion inside of our faculty. And our commitment was to address systemic barriers, some of which have been incredibly long-standing. And to do so, we tried to create some systemic responses, new funding streams, new awards, and new opportunities for black faculty, staff, and students. 
And our work has shown us that in, despite some gains, systemic racism continues to exclude our black students, our black staff, and our black faculty. So we are committed to continuing to work to address these problems. When it's combined with the intersectional, uh, intersectionality of gender, it has a disproportionate effect on especially black women. So in response, we've tried to develop a number of programs, one of which I'll mention today, which is called Advancing YU, a unique mentorship program that creates amazing opportunities for third and fourth year black and female identi identified students inside of LAMPS, which stands for Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. I use the acronym because uh, it's shorter. These programs give students an opportunity to forge a relationship with top professionals in their fields who will share similar experiences, both lived and professional, with these mentor mentees. But we still, as I mentioned before, have an incredibly far road to go that requires continued and consistent support and commitment to making change in this world. And part of that involves both listening and acting. And that's why I'm so happy that Paulette Senior is here, back at York, after five years, as one of our accomplished alumni driving positive change in our world. And I think she represents so much of what we do as a faculty and a university in our best senses and our best selves. So I'm so looking forward to hearing more about your work, Paulette, and I know that it will be really important to inform our students and our faculty and our staff here at LAMPS. So once again, thank you and welcome, Paulette. Uh, thank you, JJ. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our executive director, um, uh, Paulette Berger, excuse me, Ex executive director of strategy and administration, the other Paulette, um, Paulette Berger, to offer some remarks and to introduce our lecturer this year. <laughs> thank you, Ravi. Yes, it was only a matter of time before the Paulettes got mixed up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am excited to be here tonight to celebrate Kitty Lundy's extraordinary legacy. I'm also excited to welcome back my namesake, Paulette Senior, to York University. As president and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation since 2016, Paulette has dedicated her professional life to breaking down barriers and advocating for all women and girls with emphasis on bolstering an inclusive national movement across Canada. Her tireless work and her intersectional approach to advocacy makes her a sought after leader and a speaker on gender equity and gender based violence, women's poverty and wage gap, girls' empowerment, and that is still underrepresented amongst most women leadership. Paulette's work on leadership truly is important. In 2023, Prosperity Project's third annual report card on gender diversity and leadership paints a grim picture of BIPOC women's leadership. Women of color holds 94% of the women-held leadership roles, while indigenous and black women remain below 1%. One thing is clear from where Paulette sits, is her work has always been guided by a vision that gender equity isn't just fear, but critical to the success of society. Paulette Senior graduated from York University and began working closely with underserved communities in Toronto. There she worked to help women find traditional housing, counseling, and skills development training. Prior to her work at the Canadian Women's Foundation, she served as the CEO of the YWCA for a decade. She credits her drive to her and her commitment to adv continue advocating for underdeserved communities to grassroots work and her own personal experience. She strongly believes that her role at the Canadian Women's Foundation was created to transform the lives of women and support the underpinning of women's movement in Canada. Paulette Senior was recently appointed as a member of the Supreme Court Independent Advisory Board, and her work there has resulted in the appointment of Michelle Obansoen, the first appoint uh, sorry, the first Indigenous Justice.
to the Supreme Court of Canada. And that's not all. She served as a member of the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council, which is an advisory body that develops recommendations on gender equality issues across the G7 agenda. Tonight, Paulette Cena is here to talk about the new way forward, one where women are recognized, prioritized, and rewarded for their excellence. And while women have made enormous strides in equality over the last few decades, there is still much work to be done. I am an example of these hard gained successes as the first black woman executive director, strategy and administration of York University. Thank you, Paulette, <laughs> for paving the way for us. Your work is leading positive change and giving women the opportunity to lead and to succeed. It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, the dynamic Paulette Senior. Wow, I've never been confused with another Paulette before, so that was kind of special. Um, and I am so, so excited to, uh, to be here this evening, um, to have this opportunity to converse with you, as well as to, prior to this talk, to break bread with some new friends that I've made. Um, and I'm very thankful to the faculty, to the dean, J.J. McMurtry, to all the folks that work to create uh, this opportunity for me to come full circle and to be here this evening. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna get into my comments. I feel like I have to thank so many people, but I'm gonna just do a general thank you. Like if you showed up for me tonight, thank you. Thank you, it's appreciated and I love you for doing that. And to all the folks online, thank you also for showing up. Uh, it means a great deal. Tension defined is a state of being stretched or strained. It's a force that can strengthen us, but also break us apart. Throughout my career, it's been there, it's been present. All of us feel tension in our lives, but it's taken some time to be understood and to understand the particular kind of tension I experience and recognize and to know that I'm not alone in that. It's a tightrope between visibility and invisibility that black women navigate in a white-centric world. It's the visibility of often being the only one black woman in the room, the invisible burden of representation that we carry. It's the visibility of often being the only black woman in the room um, the visibility of protesting the status quo, knowing some will dismiss us as angry black women, we've heard that one, contrasted with the invisibility of knowing that silence is a privilege. And it's a, sim it's a privilege we simply don't have. It's the visibility of leading in structures and spaces that were historically designed to silence and destroy us and the invisibility of what it took over generations to get there. I have to go back to go forward, got it, okay. So it's a feeling of tension that late author and activist Audre Lorde captured so powerfully in the transformation of silence into language and action. And she wrote this about America. In the case of silence, each of us draws the face of our own fear, fear of contempt, of censure, or some judgment or recognition or of challenge of annihilation. But most of all, I think we fear the very visibility without which we also cannot truly live. 
within this country where racial difference creates a constant, if unspoken, distortion of vision, and Audre Lorde is deep, so you gotta follow it a bit. Black women have, on one hand, always been highly visible, and so, on the other hand, have been rendered invisible through the depersonalization of racism. And even within the women's movement, we have had to fight, and still do, for that visibility which also renders us most vulnerable, our blackness. For to survive in the mouth of this dragon we call America, we have had to learn this first and most vital lesson that we were never meant to survive. Not as human beings, and neither were most of you here today, black or not, and that visibility which makes us most vulnerable is that which is also is the source of our greatest strength because the machine will try to grind you into dust anyways, whether or not we speak. We can sit in our corners, mute forever, while our sisters and ourselves are wasted, while our children are distorted and destroyed while our earth is poisoned. We can sit in our safe corners, mute as bottles, and we will still be no less afraid. So how, as black women change makers and leaders, do we negotiate this tension of visibility and invisibility without letting it pull ourselves and our communities apart? My goal tonight is to share how I have experienced and dealt with it in the hope of empowering others to walk this challenging path, it is challenging, knowing they're not alone, and in the hope that it can help our allies and accomplices deepen their understanding of intersectional challenges black women face. I also acknowledge that I have my own learning to do about the lived experiences of other marginalized groups, women and diverse, gender diverse folks, and I humbly take this on as part of my own journey and role at the Kenyan Women's Foundation. We can only advance gender justice through truly inclusive feminist action. And on that note, I want to go back to Lord's comment about surviving the mouth, in the mouth of the dragon we call America, because many Canadians, many people like us, like to think Canada is or as being far superior when it comes to our history and current race relations. But this is a dangerous notion that perpetuates inequality and injustice. It's harmful. Here in Canada, we must continue to address the colonialism and anti-black racism that permeates all our institutions. So I want to commend York University for making efforts to do so through its framework to address anti-black racism that we heard about earlier and hope it sparks important conversations and change. For this work requires nothing less than transformation. I also want to thank the university and the Lundy family, who I understand are listening online, thank you. To thank them for having me here tonight and generously creating this particular space and opportunity for diverse speakers. I would also like to thank everyone of you who showed up uh, for being here, and my friends and family and comrades in the struggle, who together are my shield and source of support through thick and thin in equal measure. Thank you. This is indeed a full circle moment for me. My career journey started here at York University over three decades, three plus decades ago. That may, may be closer to four, but let's not count. Um, at that time, I was a shy and apprehensive student. I was surprised to have made it through various roadblocks to university, so I didn't even yet feel that I belonged or knew what I wanted to do. I had moved to Canada from Jamaica when I was 11, amid the culture shock and challenges of adjusting to a new life, I got streamed into a lower level of education by one of my teachers. This this particular message was that 
or the message that I received was that the education system here didn't see me as bright or capable. My intelligence and my talents apparently weren't visible. It was quite the opposite of my experience in Jamaica, where I regularly met or exceeded expectations. So when I started at York, I was still grappling with the shame of that experience and not necessarily wanting to be seen. When you face discrimination, invisibility can feel like a refuge. But it was here at York that I began to see the power of stepping into visibility. I saw myself reflected in other students and people I met through the Caribbean Students Association. I started to, to click with people who would become lifelong friends and began to see strength in building community. One of my professors, the late great, Dr. Percy Anderson, if you haven't heard of him, look him up, validated my right to be here. He encouraged students to bring their full selves to conversations, encouraging us to co-create spaces for open debate and dialogue. So I started to find my passion in psychology and humanities courses, connecting what I was learning with my own life experiences. The feeling that I wanted to pursue a career that would remove barriers for others was just the beginning and starting to crystallize for me. I had landed in the right place on my learning journey. But life got interrupted. Things hadn't been going well at home. The pain of my parents' separation left me without an anchor. I left school, got married at 20, and found myself in an abusive relationship that I later had to escape. It was a traumatic period that is still painful to talk about. At the time, I would have wanted to erase many of those experiences. In other words, make them invisible. But now, looking back, I know this was an important turning point in my journey toward visibility. As the dust started to settle, I returned to York in my mid-20s as the mother of a young son, now a big man, you see him there, with a, with a new sense of urgency and purpose. This time around, while working on my degree in psychology and urban studies, I started community and social service work, co-founding a tutoring program between York and Westview Centennial Secondary School, just close here to York University. I began to find my voice in student activism. It was in the 80s. It was in that time, there was a professor at Western University named Philippe Rushton. He may ring a bell to some folks. He was known for his attempts to link differences in human intelligence and race, to race. At the time, journalist David Suzuki agreed to a televised debate with Rushton about these racist ideas. So, a few of us, we took action and organized two buses to protest the debate and chanted that we have one race, the human race. We were hopeful. Another defining moment was the killing of Michael Wade Lawson in 1988. He was a 17-year-old unarmed black teenager who was shot in the back of the head by two white police officers. The officers were acquitted of second degree murder. I remember the moment well. Aside from the injustice of it, that shooting filled me with terrible fear. The fear of raising my young son in a city where black boys could be murdered with impunity. I didn't have the privilege of sitting on the sidelines, hoping for change. That event drove me to become formally involved in the movement calling for justice in policing. It meant learning to speak truth to power. There is no invisibility in doing that. It meant helping to organize marches, taking risks and criticism, and demanding fairness and accountability. It was during this period that I learned incredible lessons from seasoned activists who could expound at length, you know how we can be, we can expound at length about racism and inequality, 
and rally people around social change. They were role models and unofficial mentors at this stage of my journey. They helped set me on the path of working to challenge the status quo. And I began to recognize that if I wanted to keep doing this particular work, it would become a matter of understanding how to balance visibility and invisibility while keeping my humanity and sanity intact. After graduating from York, I gravitated toward roles at social service organizations working with women and their families to find shelter and safety from abuse as well as permanent housing and employment. This work gave me joy. I worked with people who fell through the cracks because policymakers were clueless of the impact of their structural, uh, uh, clueless of the impact of their structural oppression and how their policies reinforced systemic racism, sexism, ableism, and poverty, all intersecting to prevent progress. Scholar and writer. I think I went too far ahead. Scholar and writer and activist Moya Bailey, there she is, coined the term misogynoir to capture this experience. Bailey writes, misogynoir is not simply the racism that black women encounter, nor is it the misogyny black women negotiate. Misogynoir describes the uniquely co-constitutive, racialized, and sexual, sexist violence that befalls black women as a result of their simultaneous and interlocking oppression at the intersection of racial and gender marginalization. It's a mouthful, but think about it. As limited as race-based data collection in this country is, the evidence of how anti-black racism and misogynoir plays out is still stunning. Black women are more likely than other groups of people to live in poverty. They're more likely to be paid less than white women. Though they are highly educated, they face disproportionate barriers to entrepreneurial financial support. Studies show they are less likely to be taken seriously in the process of reporting gender-based violence. They're racially profiled and over-incarcerated. They're overrepresented when it comes to chronic illnesses like cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease and infections like COVID-19. During the pandemic, we saw how many black women pr protected the rest of us from getting sick, working on the front lines of care and community service while being underpaid and undervalued for this absolutely essential work. On an individual level, the experience of misogynoir is painful, traumatic, and damaging to mental and physical health. On a collective level, misogynoir devastates the cohesion and wellness of families and communities. And as I observed this firsthand through my work, I also noticed how the work of black and racialized women was a driving force in the movement to advance gender justice not only in communities, but across the country. Though it often remained unseen and unrecognized. I could see that experiences of gender equality varied widely depending on race and other factions and factors. And I knew it was important for the black and other marginalized women to become more vocal and visible. I think they say those who feel it most are probably the ones to lead the struggle. After years of frontline work, I started moving into mid and senior management roles and was eventually recruited to YWCA Canada as CEO, as you heard earlier, where I led Canada's largest and oldest national women's organization for over 10 years. And now as the leader of Canada's foundation for gender equality, the Canadian Women's Foundation, I'm in a position to advocate for gender justice for all women, girls, and gender diverse people in this country. 
yet the clash of visibility and invisibility is always present. It's always with me. Along this journey, I've come up against barriers and discrimination and had to learn what to endure. I've had to learn what to address, and I've had to learn what to ignore. I've endured micro and macro aggressions that have caused me to question my capabilities, my confidence, and sense of belonging. Being asked questions like, how'd you get this job? To comments like, you are so articulate. And I am, but you know, we can move on. To being asked to replace coffee at events or replenish wine glasses. These are just a few examples of situations that have been, that have been endless. In such moments, I've drawn long, deep breaths, considered my response, and choose the right thing to say or not based on what the moment calls for. As a black woman CEO, I have also grown tired of being an anomaly, particularly in spaces where high level discussions are happening and decisions are being made. It has been promising to see more progress recently and I'm watching keenly to see what happens to those black women who are in who are on the rise in these positions of leadership uh, that we've never seen before. But being the only one is a burden that no one should have to carry. So how do we continue to lead through the tension in the meantime? Personally, I can say that I draw tremendous strength from the fact that the systems designed to exploit and destroy us over hundreds of years have failed. When you consider the trauma that we have carried over generations, that in itself is miraculous. Our very presence, our voice, our leadership means we're here and we're moving forward. Part of our oppression has been being told who we are so knowing our own strengths and stories is crucial. Being able to tell them for ourselves is crucial. With time and experience, I've been able to embrace my story and develop the confidence to lead as myself, leading with a vision that is informed by who I am rather than having others tell me who I am in a transformative, it's a transformative act, if not a revolutionary one. As actress Viola Davis wrote in her memoir, Finding Me, she says, I own everything that has ever happened to me. The parts that were a source of shame are actually my warrior fuel. If you haven't read her book, I encourage you to pick it up. Along the way, I've also developed a mantra that keeps me grounded at all times. It's pretty simple, but really important to me. It's love, leadership, and community. Each of these words hold a lot of meaning for me. And I'm gonna take a moment to talk about each, sharing how they sustain me through the tension of challenging the status quo. So the first part of the mantra is love. We have to come to the work of social change from a place of love for ourselves and love for this journey and the work that we do. This reminds me of another formative experience I had here at York, which was when author and scholar Bell Hooks came as a guest lecturer. This was a long time ago. Not only did she call out the realities of being a black woman, she wrote eloquently about love in a context where black women are not deemed worthy of attention and care, where black women are told that we cannot and shall not be loved, Bell Hooks stood as a visionary light. Her work challenged me to love, care, and value myself at times when I felt as if I had to neglect myself to survive. She expressed what a tragedy it would be, have been if I had given up into that pressure so many black women feel. 
when I think about the impact it would have had on me and my young son, I, I am particularly thankful to her for the wisdom that she shared. It's also important to recognize that while anger and frustration do play a key role in mobilizing for social change, we can't allow those emotions to lead the way. One of my heroes on this path for this particular reason is Nelson Mandela. This man who spent 27 years in prison for opposing apartheid radiated such love and joy when he re-entered the world. He brought home to me that holding on to our compassion and love can also be a deliberate act of defiance and survival in spite of a mountain of evidence that we should feel hopeless about the future and give up. I love that my day-to-day -day work is about creating a more equal future. I love working with passion and passionate people who share this vision and keep working tirelessly to get there. Early on in my career, I loved the joy that came from helping someone get a job, secure, find housing, access childcare, and organize a corn roast in an underserved community, and seeing the people enjoy moments of happiness despite their everyday realities. As I've moved into leadership roles, I've loved having the opportunity to use my voice to influence policy decisions and advocate for a collective and long-term systemic change, and to do this with others. While progress is often painfully slow, there are also transformative milestones that renew my love for this work. For example, after decades of equality-seeking organizations advocating in the trenches, a national, finally, a national affordable accessible childcare program is finally becoming a reality. With some challenges, clearly, but it's here. What once seemed far too radical, can you imagine? Childcare was radical, is now a normalized public expectation, and that is a remarkable vindication and victory. Leadership is the second word in my mantra. So I'll talk about my approach to and how it's been empowering, an empowering force for me. When we picture a leader, a lot of us still, regrettably, picture a white man. We also often picture the kind of traditional leaders who have been, who have been around for so long, they kind of feel like staples and immovable, they seem like they will never actually leave. Those sort of command and control leaders who quote unquote know everything and make all the decisions. In my own leadership and at the foundation, we promote what we call inclusive leadership, which can happen in our families, in our schools, communities, in our personal and professional lives. It's not necessarily tied to an official title. Inclusive leaders work collaboratively, admitting they don't have all the answers, and sharing the power in decision making for the good of the whole. They spend more time listening and gathering diverse perspectives than telling others what to do. In recent years, more inclusive leadership styles are being embraced in business and on the world stage. It's an important shift because many brilliant and diverse women step away from leadership roles. They can't see themselves fitting the traditional mold that is a product of patriarchal, colonial, and racist institutions. And if we don't have diverse women and girls in leadership uh, uh, processes, their views aren't counted. Over the last few decades, leadership roles in most public and private institutions have slowly expanded to include women and other previously excluded groups. But without a new mindset, a new vision of inclusive and transformational leadership, our political, economic, and social systems will continue to replicate inequality. This is how I strove to leadership. 
this is what I work towards. And it's been empowering to know that I don't have to fit into that traditional mold. It's an ongoing learning journey that challenges me to be aware of my own blind spots, because I do have them, about the injustices that other marginalized communities face. I pay attention to who is and who isn't at the table and raise questions about how we can be more inclusive. I look for ways to go and open doors and bring others into spaces that might otherwise remain closed. I also have to be willing to take highly visible risks and make mistakes and learn from them. In fact, one of the most important lessons in leadership came from running for political office. You remember that? I ran three times at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels and lost rather miserably. But one of the key lessons that I learned was that effective leadership is really about galvanizing community. So I'm gonna segue into the community part now. That's a perfect spot, which is the third part of my mantra. When we're working for social change, we learn pretty quickly that none of us can do it alone. No one individual or organization can represent or speak to the unique needs of the various communities working to achieve equality and justice. To advance progress, we must work within and across communities, as well as building bridges with those who once opposed and oppressed us. If we can. Don't be mistaken. It's hard to do that. But learning how to create community is also critical because it means that we are never alone on the journey. We are more powerful when we raise our voices together and when we're tired and frustrated, we can actually lift each other up. In my work at the foundation, this means working to understand the needs of equality seeking organizations throughout Canada and advocating for funding and policy change that will strengthen all of us. It means collaborating with other organizations to raise awareness on national issues and push change forward. It means working as inclusively as possible without, with groups relegated to the margins of the country, or throughout the country. There are women living with disabilities, indigenous women, black racialized newcomer and refugee women, folks in the LGBTQIA plus communities, as well as rural and remote communities, to understand how we can better serve them and serve each other because we are also them. It means knowing when to step back and amplify the efforts of other leaders and organizations because we understand that our progress is intertwined with each other. Their progress is our progress. It means having, tr having and staying true to the spirit of the honorable, late great honorable Rosemary Brown, one of our founding mothers and the first black woman in Canada elected to a provincial legislature, who said, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. As we move forward, we measure ourselves against those particular words. I love those words. I think they were the first words coined around intersectionality. Cultivating community is also essential to black women's leadership. Through centuries of oppression and resistance, black women have developed and strengthened communities that fought for social change around the world and here in Canada. In her book, The Light We Carry, Michelle Obama talks about drawing, she talks about drawing strength from a kitchen table. How many movements start around the kitchen table? Of trusted friends and mentors who have provided ongoing support and guidance throughout her life. She says, your kitchen table is a place to rest in the storm. It's where you can pause the endless and exhausting pursuit of overcoming everyday challenges 
and safely dissect the barrage of indignities that come your way. Your kitchen table is where you go for oxygen so that you can breathe again. So I wouldn't be here where I am today without my own community, and some of them are here. The microcosm of my community is here tonight. I thank you again. Um, and also folks online. I thank you for, share, for showing up for me the way that you have tonight. It's everything, and it means everything. I come from a bunch of connected communities in all aspects of my life and journey. They are here and around the globe because I worked to form community wherever I go. So in wrapping up my comments for tonight, that's why those three words in my mantra, love, leadership, community, hold so much power for me as I continue to navigate this challenging but joyful path of advancing gender justice. I hope you will also draw strength from them in your own journeys. In our day-to-day -day lives, it's so easy to lose sight of what really matters and what holds us all together and what we're ultimately working towards, which is a more equitable and just society, a more equitable and just future. There are certainly times when, as black women, the tension we face will feel like it's tearing us apart. I've had those days. But within us, we also carry an incredible legacy of not only surviving, but thriving in spite of it. The poet Maya Angelou speaks to this powerfully. So I'll leave you with an excerpt from her masterpiece, Still I Rise. It's popular, but it's worth saying here. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide. Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. Paulette, thank you. Thank you very much for this generous, moving and, and deeply encouraging lecture. Uh, very grateful. Um, <coughs> as I said earlier, Paulette has uh, um, generously offered to answer some questions and uh, I'm, yeah, we welcome those. Uh, there's at least one microphone here somewhere, so please do uh, uh, jump up and uh, ask a question. I do have uh, one from online, uh, one of our audience online, uh, who is actually a, an undergraduate student. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student and haven't uh, yet decided what my major should be. Do you feel that you made the right choice about your uh, degree and uh, do you use it every day? Oh. What a great question. <laughs> um, well, there's so many ways I could answer that, but let me say that your degree is, the only, is, is only the beginning of your journey. It really is only the beginning. Um, for me, from when I was a kid, I wanted to do psychology, and uh, so for me, that was a dream fulfilled at that time. I would say that I, have, I utilized that in the earlier parts of my career, um, it, it helped me in terms of understanding people and myself. Um, I also double majored in, uh, in urban studies because I was particularly interested in 
the environments that we deliberately create and what those environments do to us as human beings. Um, and I was particularly interested in Canada's um, way of building public housing communities um, and whether or not folks are meant to survive and thrive in them or not. So uh, I would say it still informs my work, but I would also say that it really is only the beginning of your journey uh, in terms of the path that you'll take. And these days, your journey uh, will have many uh, intersections, cross sections. Um, and I think the most important part after you've decided what you're going to do, because whatever you take on doing is probably the right thing, <laughs> but it's also um, uh, the full human being that you are as you do the work you do that matters. Thank you. Great advice. Uh, yeah, we often meet uh, uh, young people and as well as parents who think this is the moment that will change and determine everything. And uh, um, so I think that's great advice, especially for all the undecided majors out there. Um, so please, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, do jump up and uh, uh, feel free to ask uh, any questions. Yes, please. I think there's one on the floor. Is that, should the microphone should be on. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a quick question. You spoke about uh, uh, being a woman in leadership and talking about um, this need to distinguish between when to speak up, when to be silent, and when to ignore. And I'm just wondering if you can expand on that a little bit and talk about um, how you actually develop that ability to make that distinction, um, given that uh, there are so many tensions for women of color in leadership roles. I like that you use the word distinction. Thank you for the question. I like that you use the word distinction. Um, because I think living in a distinction of leadership is important and understanding that as a leader, your presence and how you engage with people um, matters as a leader, right? So distinguishing for myself what that is uh, was really important in deciding for me um, who, who I am and who I'm going to be in moments, particularly in challenging moments. Um, that said, being human is even more important, right? So it's, it's the balancing of taking care of yourself as a human being, but also realizing that you carry the distinction of leadership. Um, and that there, there are always um, people to challenge that, whether in front of you or behind you, right? The challenge will be there. So I weigh that. Literally, I weigh it. I, I, um, I remember the moment, one of the moments that I was asked um, if I'm the one um, that's coming to speak. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, just, it's okay to just smile and nod and say, yes, it's me. I'm what you got. And then other times I would say, why? We're expecting someone else. You know? Um, and sometimes the things I really want to say, I kind of hold that back a little bit <laughs> because it may not forward the moment and it could be a teachable moment, right? It could be a moment where that person goes away and probably will never do that again, you know? Or if I'm asked about, will there be more wine coming? I said, I don't know, do you know? You know, so really utilizing it to kind of send a few messages at the same time to say, don't try that with me, <laughs> right? But also uh, uh, check yourself. 
check yourself, because what kind of assumptions are you working on that you would think I'm here to replenish your wine? You know? So uh, sometimes I'm direct and sometimes I'm not, and it depends on my energy, and it depends on what the moment calls for. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Please. My check, one, two, one, two. Can I be heard? Fantastic. Uh, Munzungu is the name, honor and a pleasure. I know I came a little bit late, but I had to come on time. So, um, with all that being said, uh, my question is this. Um, in advancing equity-driven leadership, what are words of wisdom you can share when it comes to navigating different places and spaces? So we're looking at the academic sector, the corporate sector, the political field. Based on your experience, and most importantly, based on your wealth within your journey, what have been the key lessons, the key takeaways when it comes to navigating those spaces and still maintain your integrity and your authenticity as an African Canadian woman within these spaces? I hope that wasn't too long, sorry. Um. It's an amazing question. <laughs> and I think it's a build on from the previous question because um, you mentioned um, being an African Canadian woman leader in this country. Um, you mentioned the importance of navigating, um, and you mentioned um, wisdom. And uh, to me, in terms of my journey, I actually listened to some pretty wise people, right? Because um, I was a leader, probably in my late, like official leader in my late 30s, mid to late 30s, in terms of um, you know, managing people, running things, so to speak. And so I leaned on people who, um, who I really admired in terms of how they navigated. Mm -hmm. um, and I would share with them what my challenges were. Because for my entire career, I've really worked in mainstream organizations, right? And even though it's been gender-focused organizations, it, it can be no less oppressive. Um, so for me, I, I, I take the wisdom of others. I can see some of the folks that I've talked to um, who have advised me well. Um, and a couple of the things. I'm grounded in who I am. I know who I am. It's no question who I am. I embrace that. Um, I embrace the things that would cause shame and the things that uh, are building for me, right? So there is no outing me in that space, right? And, and, and so if I walk into a room, I walk in with confidence. I walk in as if I belong. And to me, I was always searching for that belongingness. You know, when I was uh, a student, um, from the moment I came to Canada, I was always searching for that sense of belonging. And the sense of belonging was in me. I discovered and uncovered. And it's in embracing your full selves, I think, that you can navigate. Because once you understand who you are, and you learn the environment that you're in, and you see things coming, because I think that's another gift. Sometimes you got to see them coming before they get to you. Right? And when you see them coming before they get to you, it, it, it gives you the, the space to figure that out and determine how you're gonna be in that space in that moment. But I think the most important thing is, is embracing your full selves, knowing who you are, and not have anybody else tell you who you are. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank it, you. It sounded challenging, so I'm glad I was able to answer it. Can Do you I have another one? Yeah, if you don't Please mind. Uh, okay, cool, um, just one more. <laughs> Um, I think my next question, and to your point, um, the complexity in the journey. So I kind of wanted to gauge and to see um, how can we confront the invisibility issue with black women? I say this because in, it doesn't matter which sector you're in, the invisibility issue has been 
go ongoing for a very long time. So yes, we speak about authenticity and boldness and confidence and all that jazz, but what are the specific ways that the structural issues that confront different sectors as it pertains to that issue, when it comes to black women being invisible, even though we work the hardest, we do the most work, we're in the back every time. So I kind of wanted to gauge that perspective as well. Well, um, it's, it's a space that only some of us have to exist in, that visible invisibility. And, you know, I, I have been in situations where I have to say, wait a minute, you don't see me here? I'm standing right here. Or um, I become so visible that it's a danger to me to be that visible. Um, so for me, being able to navigate that with a certain sense of certainty and um, success, let's say, um, is constant. It never goes away. Um, I think talking to folks who are also occupying those roles um, has really helped me a lot. So beyond the mentorship and the wisdom, but talking to, um, to black sisters and black folks who do that every day um, has been a bit of a guiding post for me to, to figure out what their strategies are and then to create my own out of it. And, and you know, there's some of, it's systemic for sure. And that's where um, systems and direct oppression collide, right? And it's, to me, it's, uh, it's a space that requires um, mental refreshing constantly. Your mental health uh, matters in those moments and taking care of it through nurturing with people who love you, know you and love you, um, is, nourishes you to be able to withstand what you shouldn't have to withstand. Um, I mean, I'm amazed that I'm standing here um, after some of the things I've had to endure, uh, but I'm also uh, fortified by the fact that I had some early navigators ahead of me um, that, that showed me how to stand firmly in my shoes and um, speak truth to power without fear. And even if I'm fearful, I will speak. Because if you don't speak, you're still suffering. You're suffering in silence. So it's important to use your voice at all times. Always do those reminders to folks who step where they shouldn't with you, right? And, and as you're working because if, you're, if you yourself are not healthy and nourished to do the work, then you can be taken out from, for different reasons. So it's important to surround yourself with people who get it and will stand when you can't and hold you up when you need that. Uh, because it isn't, it isn't a, an easy battle, but it's also one that um, not everybody knows what it's like, and there are varying degrees of it, right? So not all racialized people go through it at the same level of impact. And that impact is most felt by black and indigenous people, by black and indigenous women, to be quite frank we're the ones that feel it the most. And because we feel it the most, 
there's much we have in common that we have to share. Sometimes it's not even worth uttering the words because just looking into each other's eyes, we know because we've done it. I've also um, in the past been a part of um, and put together with other folks uh, um, gatherings that focus on black women's leadership. And I have found that to be helpful uh, because it's almost like a place that black women just come and put down their heavy loads and burdens and they can just be themselves because they spend so much time in a space where that is not possible. But here's how I'm gonna wrap that up because <laughs> I don't want to keep going. How I'm gonna wrap it up is, set, is by saying this, uh, and this is about me. I have earned the right to use my voice. I have paid my price, so I'll use my voice. And so that will not stop. Um, and it's a journey I've walked that has taught me some lessons. And what I've learned is, while you're leading with humility and kindness and love and caring and compassion, you must lead in a way that tells the world that you're here and you're not leaving. Thank you so very much for using your voice to speak to power. I'm done. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. And thank you for your question. We might have time for one more. If there is. Yes, please. Come on up. Hello, and thank you so much for that. Um, it's quite an honor to listen to you, and I recently uh, heard you at your Signal for Help uh, event. I thought you looked familiar. Yes, um, and this is extremely special for me to see um, someone like you in, in your position at Canadian Women Foundation, and just in your work in general, not only as a fellow York alumni, but also as a Caribbean woman myself. Um, you spoke to so many poignant points tonight, um, and I really thank you for that. Especially, you know, being an anomaly as a black woman leader. And you started to touch on, um, well, not started, you did go into it, on uh, the framework for inclusive leadership, and I found that really interesting. I think that the nonprofit and uh, social justice sector, in spe uh, specifically, uh, reflects currently a certain, um, like the structural violence and systemic oppression that exists outside of it. And I'm really glad you brought to light misogynoir in this space. Um, and I've been looking at how that now presents, specifically in our nonprofit sector, how that then translates into discriminatory hiring and promoting practices, which leads to people like you being an anomaly in, in those positions. My question is, um, what are some pragmatic ways or frameworks that you feel would be best um, for us to all address this right now? Uh, I've been hearing from quite a few black women leaders about how they're able to pave the way. And my concern is there may be a gap, so what can we do in the meantime until there's more of us up there? I hope that's clear. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's good to see you again. Um, misogynoir is only something black women know and experience. Um, and you talk about paving the way. Uh, my, my, my hope um, at this stage of my career is not to lay down a template to follow, right? It's really to demonstrate a few things. One, it's possible, and it's possible for more than one. It's possible for many. I'm not that special, right? So I wanna be clear about that. The specialness thing is a problem. Um, and that happens when not enough of us are hired. Um, but to also say that, um, so I'm not, I'm not interested in the template. I'm really interested in 
supporting folks to figure out their paths and hopefully equipping them with strategies to navigate it. Because the times that I exist in and existed in that got me here um, are much more complex and robust than uh, um, like today, today's time is much more complex and robust than they were uh, in my time. I believe that. Now we can debate that back and forth. And it's difficult, it's impossible for me to know what it's like to be a young black woman today. It's impossible. I don't know. So I, so laying down a template is not a good idea. But equipping you with the tools and strategies that will fortify you to withstand the, the stresses and strains and oppressions that will come at you, I think that's the answer, right? So um, no formula, just an opportunity to, um, be because, and then so th that's on the individual level. And then on the systemic level, right, there are tools and strategies to address that. And we have to work in both places. Because um, while you yourself have um, has to navigate um, these barriers that present themselves, that's an individual level. But systemically, there is some systems change work and justice change work that needs to happen so that you don't have to work that damn hard at it, right? And to normalize some things so that when you look around, you can see others around you doing that work, right? And you don't feel so alone and that we can do, uh, do an end or have an end to the firsts, right? In this day and age, we're still having firsts. We need to do away with firsts. And in order to do that, we need to bring about the systems change uh, to create those environments. Well, thank you, and thank you again for your questions. Uh, uh, let me ask you all to uh, congratulate our, uh, and thank our speaker again tonight, Paulette. Well, that's all the time we have this evening, and uh, I want to close by uh, thanking Paulette Senior again for your lecture, lecture and inspiration. Um, some quick thanks that uh, events like these wouldn't be possible without uh, quite a few people. Uh, I want to thank our communications and event team, Natalia and Anam and Ashwarya and uh, Krishika, uh, Nicole, uh, who's not here, Bindu and uh, Vicky and probably others uh, um, I'm not uh, remembering right now, but uh, uh, can't, we can't do these events uh, without you. Thank you very much. I want to thank our ASL interpreters, as always, and our colleagues for, from the uh, LTS uh, team uh, for uh, helping stream and record the event tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, here uh, in person and also online. Um, uh, for joining us for this year's lecture. Uh, we hope you enjoyed Leading in the Tension, Conundrums of Invisibility for Black Women Leaders. Good night, everyone. <laughs>